Eric Darnell, director of the Madagascar films, also the director of Ants, one of the pioneers not only of computer-generated animation, we must credit you for being one of the directors who got that format off the ground. I don't think you're given as anywhere near as much credit as Pixar gets. <laughs> uh, Ants was, I understand, the second uh, computer-generated animated film released. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're going to give you... I, I give you, Eric Donnell, due credit for that. But also now you are in... Is it fair to say your post CGI animated feature phase, and you have now moved into virtual reality animation? This is correct with your company, Baobab. Baobab, you said it Baobab. perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I left uh, DreamWorks about yes. a year yeah, and a half yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us the give us just the potted the potted history of your beginnings that take you up to the start of your company and what your intentions were and how your ambitions have shifted. <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, I was really inspired um, back in undergraduate school when I was getting my degree in journalism by a filmmaker named Stan Brackage who did avant-garde, abstract films, uh, like one of the most famous and yet most unknown filmmakers of the 20th century. Um, and so by the time I graduated with my journalism degree, I was ready to go live in a mud hut and make my own experimental films. And uh, I went to gra uh, uh, graduate school and I studied experimental animation. And that's where I first kind of got into the whole computer thing because back then computers were very experimental. And I continued to do my sort of, quote, avant-garde um, work or at least aspirations. <laughs> and um, after graduate school, I found my way to Pacific Data Images. This was around 1991, the oldest computer animation company in existence at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, they were doing television commercials, but there were a group of guys that really wanted to do storytelling there. And uh, we tried and we tried, and it was really difficult until finally Dreamers came along and said, let's help you guys tell the stories you want to make, and you can help us do our first computer animated film. Okay. So I was lucky enough... Uh, you know, nobody besides John Lasseter at the time had directed a computer animated film, so I was lucky to be picked along with my partner, Tim Johnson, and we began with uh, Ants, which became the first film that um, DreamWorks released, an uh, animated film of any type. Um, and, um, and then from there, it just went on. And, you know, I sort of evolved from being this guy that was willing to live in a mud hut and make my own films that only my mother would love to uh, <laughs> to finding a way to make films that hopefully millions of people would love. And okay. so that was the biggest transition for me and um, one that, you know, I really enjoyed. And now I really love the idea of taking what I've learned from doing, um, you know, storytelling with characters that people fall in love with and that they want to spend time with from the cinema into virtual reality. Right. Let's let's now fast forward to that because you've made a six-minute film called Invasion, which I think is probably the best possible showcase for what it is you want to do with 360 virtual reality animated films. It's a beautiful movie. It's The impact is so powerful that I don't quite understand why there aren't more people screaming from the rooftops that this is the format to come, that it is not a gimmick-driven format that 3D can arguably be said to be. This is, based on what I've seen, and I'm a bastard when it comes <laughs> to being a critic, this is sensational stuff. Why aren't more people screaming this from the rooftops, Eric Darnell? You know, I think it's going to take a little a little bit of time. For one, people have to try VR to really know what it's like. If you haven't tried it, you just think it's a bunch of hoo-ha, you know? It's a bunch of hype. And a lot of the things that people are creating content-wise are just sort of tech demos, you know? It's, it's basically the, the old 3D movie of people sticking their hands towards camera, like, look, it's 3D! And it's a lot of that is the content that's out there. And people aren't really sure how to use this medium yet. So 
it's just going to take some time. It, it's sort of like the beginning of cinema, and it's often compared to that, where, you know, the beginnings of cinema was like trains coming into the station, you know, people, you know, doing rope trick <laughs> acts. And <laughs> I actually kind of was going to ask, in terms of the evolution of the form, where are we at now? Are we at the Lumiere Brothers tent with the train coming into the station with the guys shooting at the audience and having everybody duck? Is that kind of where we are now? I think it is kind of where we are, um, you know, but I think that there are folks out there that recognize that um, that the gee whiz factor will go away fairly quickly and that people are going to want what they always want, which is depth, which comes from great stories with great characters and and just stuff that you can actually care about. Mm, because I want to get down to brass tacks about what your artistic approach is to this new medium. You quite rightly mentioned before that uh, the tech heads are the ones basically putting out a lot of the demo reels. And quite frankly, too much of the discussion has been technical. I don't care. I don't think anyone cares about the technological discussion behind it. It's what you are delivering or what you intend to deliver that I want to talk to you about. You are one of the most successful directors of computer-generated animated films on the planet. Those Madagascar films have made like about $3 billion. So when directing a virtual reality animation, your approach, I understand, is that you want to maintain traditional storytelling elements in this new form. How do you do that? Well, that is the big question. That is the question. And it's like, you know, if you look at uh, movies or books uh, or plays, you know, they all are very distinct media, media, mediums. Um, and they, but they, and they all media have... is the plural. Sorry. <laughs> OK. And uh, and yet they all serve, at least for the most part, this higher calling of telling a great story. And though the tools for telling a great story are essentially the same across all all the media, but each specific media has their very own set of toolkit, toolkits, you know, to, to, to accomplish this higher order of, of goals. And so for me, VR is the same way. If we're going to deliver storytelling, there are classic storytelling traditions and histories and rules and guides and whatever you want to call it that people um, turn to. Um, but the toolkit that we have is completely different than what you have with books or movies or anything else. And so problem is nobody knows what's inside that toolkit yet. It's like you open it up, it's a black box, you stick your hand in, you, you pull something out and you go, what does this do? Right. And then you have to try it. Okay, so let's just get specific for a second with Invasion. It is basically about a little bunny rabbit uh, who lives on the, sh on the uh, shore of a frozen lake uh, who is out one day and is visited by a couple of knucklehead aliens. It's set on the frozen lake surface and basically you the viewer are the bunny are the friend of the bunny rabbit right. and if you look and you have to look pretty pretty steeply down you can actually see your own body now when you're wearing this device on your head you could look absolutely anywhere that you like as a viewer you as a director don't want people presumably to look anywhere they want at any time at certain times you want them to look in a particular direction so that you can direct the story how are you managing that what are the cues you're using what are the techniques you're using to master that because in the middle of a big scene where you've gone to so much trouble to render an environment I'm sorry, people are just going to want to look around. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, one little, you, you said it absolutely right, but there's one little nuance to it, which is I want people to look where they want to look, but I want to inspire them to look where I want them to look when they look where they want to look, <laughs> you know? And so the way you do that is to give them interesting things to attract their attention. Give them enough time to watch the clouds roll by and go, wow, those trees are beautiful and hey, it's snowing and all those things. But once you've sort of established that stuff, then you give them reasons to look. You give them a sound that they can only hear in their right ear and they don't see. So they look to their right and they see the, the uh, source of that sound, which could be a hawk coming down to take your little bunny friend away. Um, even... Um, the bunny herself can can suddenly react and look off screen and it's just natural for you to look where the bunny's looking what is she looking at what has she found and then you do the same thing so you're making all the choices yourself you don't feel like you're being manipulated you want to look these places and if i do my job right 
you're also looking where I want you to look at the same time. Right. So you can use sound, you can use other characters, um, and you can also use the environment in a way so that when the viewer looks a certain place, they've actually composed the shot that you wanted them to compose naturally mm -hmm. because it's a beautiful place to look. And then suddenly something happens in that place that they're looking. And so it's, it's a kind of a different way of thinking. And just to, you know, if I had started out with the idea that I had and just made it from beginning to end without showing it to anybody, it would have been a complete failure. Right. But what we did was we made a version and then we put it in front of fresh eyes, a thousand fresh sets of eyeballs, literally, mm. um, and watched how people watch things and said, they're not looking where I want them to look. I need to do something to inspire them to look there. And then we made lots of changes along the way in terms of timing and the sound levels and what things are happening and when to, to make that all happen. So testing, 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 and finally we got there because we don't know. Right. VR is brand new. We don't have the experience. We don't know. Now, just for the naysayers, for the devil's advocates out there, can you explain why VR is not 3D Mark II? Because as you know full well, Eric Darnell, people for the last, since Avatar, have had it shoved down their throats that 3D is the next big thing. And although in certain circumstances, films work beautifully in 3D, by and large, people have kind of said, look, it, it's still just a gimmick. It's a bigger gimmick this time, and you're doing it with bigger films, but more or less, we can take it or leave it. Why is VR different? You know, I tend to agree with that about, about cinema. I mean, the 3D stuff is just sort of an extension of the kind of experience we, are, we already have. And sometimes I confess that after about 10 minutes, I sort of forget I'm watching it in 3D, and it, it kind of maybe doesn't matter to me. You know, my wife saw one 3D movie and she didn't feel good after. And she said, why would I pay extra money to feel nauseous? So <laughs> she won't go to one. But the thing is, and the only the only way you can ever really know this is to put a headset on. I can't tell you why it's different, but VR is not an extension of cinema. It is a whole different thing. Yes. And, you know, you go to a movie, you sit in a dark room with a bunch of other people, you look at a rectangle into another world that you can never be a part of with characters that have no idea that you exist. And yet, you know, we are profoundly moved by that experience. You know, it's, you know, in the darkened theater is probably where the only place where some grown men cry, you know, and even a mediocre movie can make you cry. It's like, this isn't even a good movie. Why? What's that tear doing there? You know, so it has a powerful emotional um, possibility for the audience. But nevertheless, virtual reality is completely different. You're not sitting in a chair staring through a window. You are actually on that frozen lake, looking around as the snow falls, as we've talked about. A bunny spots you from the shore, makes eye contact, is excited to see you, hops over, recognizes that you are in her world, and that matters to her, and she reacts to you that way. And I tell you, people... Uh, you know, because like I said, I've watched thousands of people do this. They're absolutely delighted by this. They reach out and try to touch the bunny. They mirror her poses, which is something we do when we're trying to communicate and connect with each other. Um, one guy even told me that because there's a point in the story where the bunny hides behind you and kind of uses you as a shield for yeah. protection from the aliens, dangerous rays. And um, he said, you know, I watched the bunny go behind me and then I wanted to see what the aliens were doing. So I looked back. And it was the weirdest thing because I know I'm just standing in your office, but I could feel that bunny's presence behind me, almost like I could feel her breath on the back of my neck. I mean, it was probably the air conditioning system, mm. but, you know, he said it was so weird because I wasn't even seeing her, but she was real to me. And you don't have that kind of experience when you go to the movies, you know, it's just a different thing entirely. And the, what's most profound about it is that there is now an opportunity to not just have the viewer watch the story, but for the viewer to become a part of the story, which is huge. Now, how far away do you think we are from, I don't know, cinemas where we can see 360 films, um, seeing them at home, downloaded as an app, as you can now with, with some content with Samsung, um, with the, uh, what's it called, Oculus? Mm -hmm. But the Oculus, how far away are we from it being part of mainstream entertainment? Well, 
You know, I don't know, but I, I think that, um, you know, we're, I'm basically fairly conservative about this because I've got a brand new company and we're trying to like have enough money to survive until this becomes a mass market. But I think within the next couple of years, honestly, and the reason is because there's several billion smartphones out there in the world. This isn't going to be the thing where peop everybody's going to rush out and spend $3,000 on headsets and equ expensive equipment and clear out their living room so that they have a space to walk around in. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But as a mass market, I think it will happen in the next 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. um, but the exciting thing for me is what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, this is not anything you can really plan for now because things are changing so quickly. But I really believe that that holodeck idea that we're all familiar with from Star Trek is going to exist in my lifetime. And I'm not that young. <laughs> but things are changing and growing so quickly that... Um, pretty soon the headsets are going to get lighter and lighter and pretty soon you're not going to realize you have anything on and before you know it you know all of our other senses will be engaged and you won't have to wear anything and it will be like you're really truly there just to come back to the the, the, the style of directing and how you're wanting to bring traditional storytelling into this format is it also possible that while on the one hand there are obviously times in order to keep a story going where you need to focus the person's, the viewer's attention. Is it also possible that at other times, for instance, during a chase scene or just during an establishment shot where you might actually take an extra minute or two more than you would conventionally so that people have a minute or two to look around and explore an environment before getting a cue from the director that okay now the action is starting and you're going to look in this direction because someone has started speaking dialogue is that a possibility the reason why i'm asking that eric is because right at the beginning of invasion we're in space we are floating in space looking at the earth and i thought to myself i'd like to just pause the film right here and just float in space for a couple of minutes <laughs> it's so powerful I mean, what do you think of, of, of that concept? I think that's absolutely valid. I mean, I, I think the idea that, that um, the things have to be, you know, down to the second structured for audiences is not necessarily um, needed in VR. You know, what I would say is if there's a time for, for the audience to explore, um, that it should be a time to be discovering things that help tell the story. You know, if you're in somebody's room there should be things that tell you what you need to know about that character to understand them better, for example, you know. And there's games that work on this premise already um, where you sort of explore and you discover things about characters that perhaps you haven't even met yet. Um, and I, I think that, that things will get more fluid as we get better at the language of it all. But I do go back to the, you know, whenever I'm playing a game, and I like games and games in VR, you know, made in heaven, but whenever I get to a place in a game where suddenly I feel like I'm stuck and I'm, I'm trying to solve some puzzle or I'm trying to kill the zombies or whatever it is and I just don't seem to be making any progress. You know, I'm saying, well, as soon as I say to myself, well, what do the game makers expect me to do now? Then I, I'm out. You know, right. I'm, I'm out of the experience. I'm trying to understand what some game creator has decided. And those are the kinds of experiences that can just destroy the sort of momentum yes. that you have when you're telling a story. And I think a lot of games where it's not necessarily story first kind of do that already. You know, you're building up some story, some plot, some character, and then you stop and you flatline as you like solve puzzles or kill zombies or whatever mm -hmm. for a while. In fact, you may lose some momentum and then you've got to like recapture that again. And if you look at a really tightly constructed story, it's all about this precision timing. You know, it's, it's timing, it's pacing, it's structure, and it's designed to build the audience up to this cathartic moment of discovery or, or emotional upheaval or whatever it is. And the more flexibility or variability you have in that, I think the harder it's going to be to maintain that maximum moment of, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, where you have that moment that Aristotle described as like um, completely unexpected, but also completely inevitable. And um, that's what, to me, what great storytelling is all about. So I'm trying to find this balance. And maybe I'm a bit of a Luddite, you know, maybe I'm, I'm just sort of clinging to the past a little bit too much. But I know that great stories can be really powerful. And I'd rather tell a great story with characters that people f can fall in love with and sacrifice some interactivity so that at the end of the day, the viewer comes out and says, wow, 
I want to know more about that bunny or yeah. those aliens. And if there's another piece out with them, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, and it's it's great. I'm really being heartened by what you're saying because what you're saying is basically echoing what John Lasseter said when he made Toy Story and what Walt Disney always said, that all of the technique, all of the brilliance, all of the technological wonderment, all has to serve story. And at the end of the day, it's the forward propulsion of a story with characters that matter that ultimately is the goal of any storytelling technology. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of people that will say things like, well, you know, why are we trying to tell stories in VR? VR is a whole different medium. It should have its own thing. And, and I, you know, we should only design or come up with new stories that are only right for VR, whatever it is. But, you know, I don't know. You know, Shakespeare was a pretty good writer, they say. And, um, you know, his um, Macbeth or no, his Othello was kind of a good little play to read back. You know, it was probably a good play to see several hundred years ago. There's been versions of it where people are wearing Nazi uniforms or whatever. Those are interesting to see. <laughs> and um, and there's been movies that have been made uh, of that story. Those weren't bad. It wasn't like, well, you can't make a movie out of this play because it's most supposed to be a play. And then they made another movie called Lion King. And that was based on Shakespeare. And yet it was done with animals and it was told and it was animated. And, you know, so I think that that it's it's not that you can't tell a story just because it came from somewhere else. You know, Lord of the Rings was a good book. It was a good movie. I mean, but um, that you have to find how do we tell this story inside of this medium in a way that makes it that takes advantage of what the medium has to offer. Are you, are you making another feature? No. So what are you doing now? We're doing short films right now at right. Baobab. Um, you know, it takes several years to make a feature film, and things are changing so quickly in VR that I, I sort of say, it's like we'd be in our VR cave and we'd come out and go, look, wheel, in four years, and everybody else would be flying around in jetpacks, you know? I mean, who knows? So by doing really short stuff, we learn a tremendous amount. We can apply what we learn to the next thing. We can get content out there on a really regular basis so that audiences can say, oh, Bad Bab Studios came out with something else. Let's check that out. And it's good for the market. It's good for our company. It's good for our ability to learn what this medium is all about because we, we don't claim to know anything. It, it's just going to take some time for, I think, if it if it ever happens for the technology to kind of settle into some place where it makes sense you know it, there has to be the obviously the ability to get the return on the on the money that you invest or somebody invests in these things and it becomes a, a very much an economic equation as well as a creative one i right now for me i don't want to wear a headset for mm. an hour and a half or 2 hours they're not that comfortable mm. yet um but they'll get there i'm going to ask you why did you do this now, I'm presuming that you were in a pretty bloody comfortable spot when you decided to go on this venture, that you could have lived the rest of your life making high-profile, A-list, studio, mass-market entertainments and make millions of dollars per project and just live the rest of your life as a very comfortable, acclaimed, ultra-successful director. Why did you go <laughs> off that course to this course, which I imagine is much riskier? Normal people like us want to know the thinking behind decisions like that because it's a major thing that you've done. Well, I suppose comfort is overrated, you know? If you get too comfortable, you know, life isn't interesting anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I've made five feature films over the course of 20-something years, and um, it was starting to feel like, yeah, I could kind of keep doing this and I could do it again and again. And um, But it, it wasn't inspiring me the way that it was when I started out. And what when I look back at my career and said, what were the most exciting times? I mean, there were certainly times that were exciting, like when I got my first directing gig on Ants um, and when certainly when the movie came out and it did well. And, and, and I've been fortunate that the Madagascar films were really well received and that's all very exciting but you have to look at like day to day what is it like to get up in the morning and when I think back the most exciting times in my life and just in terms of getting up in the morning and going to work were when I first started in computer animation when you never knew what your day was going to be you know when you were learning something new every day and that you know I would be in bed awake at 3 a.m. going, wait, I could try this. I could do that. And I'd be at work at 4.30 in the morning, like trying stuff because I was so excited about these new ideas that were pumping through my head. And um, 
I think I saw that in VR, there was an opportunity to return to a degree to that place because this is the Wild West, as everybody says. You, nobody knows what they're doing, despite what anybody claims. Um, there's so much to be discovered. It's the great unknown. And um, certainly, you know, I've got the luxury of taking that risk after 20 years, you know, doing what I did before. Um, and it's, it's just going to reinvigorate me in a way that, you know, I'm 50 some years old. I'm not getting any younger. And it's nice to be excited about something that's, that has a, where I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow.